Um, hi, uh, my name is Farah Fokkert and um, I'm a neuroethicist at the Bioethics Institute Ghent in uh, Belgium at Ghent University. And I've written, uh, my one of my main research interests is moral enhancement and recently I've written a paper uh, on moral enhancement uh, together with my colleague Maartje Schermer. Hello, uh, my name is Maartje Schermer. I work as a medical philosopher and ethicist at the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And I work together with Farah on a project on moral enhancement, which is one of my research interests. Um, we will uh, introduce uh, our paper uh, to you and um, I will start by thanking on behalf of both of us the editors of the blog Brain for inviting us and the editor of the journal Neuroethics for uh, cooperating with this uh, symposium and a special thanks of course to all our commentators. Uh, we really look forward to reading the comments and to uh, discussing our thoughts uh, with you and hopefully to uh, improve them and to learn from them. So the topic of our paper is moral enhancement and the main question is whether the means to attain moral enhancement matter morally. Now what do we mean with moral enhancement? Uh, enhancement, uh, broadly conceived, uh, com uh, is, um, uh, means those kind of changes or interventions in the human being that are intended to improve certain aspects of his functioning or capacities. And moral enhancement is kind of a new and rather controversial uh, domain uh, within an the enhancement debate. Now there are different conceptions of what moral enhancement might mean. Some uh, definitions focus more on the uh, affective abilities like empathy, uh, others focus on uh, the outcomes of behavior, uh, still others say that it's more about moral decision-making or about improving virtues. Uh, and in the paper we argue that uh, moral uh, enhancement uh, should be aimed at uh, the very complex interplay of all kinds of moral capacities, <coughs> excuse me, such as uh, cognitive, affective and motivational capacities and their complex interplay. And the aim of moral enhancement would be to improve both moral thought and decision-making as well as moral behavior. Now, there are different means to attain uh, moral enhancement. There are more traditional means, such as moral education or, for example, therapy. Uh, think of aggression regulation therapy for somebody who has uh, difficulty in uh, containing his aggressive impulses, for example. Uh, but there are also uh, new, uh, more biomedically uh, oriented uh, methods that at least promise the potential for moral uh, enhancement. Um, examples of these are uh, deep brain stimulation or transcranial magnetic stimulation, perhaps uh, transcranial direct current stimulation. And uh, all of these more biomedical means uh, have in common is that they act kind of directly on the brain. And this leads us to the main question of our paper, does it matter which means we attain uh, or um, use to attain moral enhancement? Are certain means bad in themselves or morally suspect? Are certain means morally better than others? Um, and we mainly focus on a distinction that has been made in the literature between direct and indirect interventions. Now, indirect indir interventions uh, are those interventions that target the brain directly and that through this uh, working on the brain affect the mind or change the mind of a person. So deep brain stimulation would be an example of this. Indirect interventions are those interventions that uh, act on the mind of a person, so education or therapy, and thereby, in the end, indirectly affect changes in the brain. Now, intuitively, uh, many people, uh, we believe, would say that direct interventions are somehow more problematic than indirect interventions. Acting directly on the brain to change minds of persons seems somehow morally uh, problematic. Um, however, we argue in the paper that this is not the main morally relevant distinction, but that the distinction uh, should not be so much the one between direct and indirect interventions, but what we call between active and passive interventions. With active interventions, we mean those interventions that require the subject of the intervention to uh, participate in, uh, in a certain way, to uh, psychologically or behaviorally uh, put some effort in the changes um, to attain the desired outcome. So, for example, in therapy, a person is asked to uh, practice certain modes of, of thinking or behaving differently and to actively be involved in uh, producing the kind of changes that are deemed desirable. 
Um, on the other hand, passive interventions uh, require no participation of the subject at all. So uh, direct interventions such as deep brain stimulation would count as passive interventions in the sense that they don't require the subject to be involved in any psychological or behavioral way, but that the uh, electric impulses in the brain just uh, affect their changes without uh, active involvement of the of the subject, uh, in a way they leave the subject the passive recipient of these changes. Um, so the main difference between active and passive uh, interventions, again, is whether the subject is actively involved in the intervention, uh, psychologically or behaviorally, uh, or whether he's a passive recipient. And we think that is the main morally relevant difference between certain types of interventions. And why do we think uh, that this is a moral difference? Well, I will hand over here to my colleague Farah to say something about the conclusions of our paper. Thank you, Marce. Um, so, in our paper, we argued that there are three main differences between active and uh, passive interventions that are um, ethically, normatively relevant. So, um, the first is the fact that um, passive interventions are um, very different in the way the process is brought about. So in case of, for example, an active intervention such as therapy, the changes that are brought about are very gradual in nature, very incremental in nature, and can be reflected on um, in a step-by-step -step pro process. So basically the changes that are happening, the way in which uh, an individual's life has changed, the way in which his or her social relations may change, um, that are things that the individual actually works on him or herself and that actually can think about are these changes beneficial for me or not and are these changes something that I can and want to incorporate in my own life story, in my own narrative. So it's a very active process that allows for a lot of uh, reflection and a lot of continuous rational deliberation on the process itself and the changes that are brought about within this process. So it allows for a lot of autonomous choice, not only at the start of the, the intervention, but throughout, throughout the entire intervention, individuals are um, in some sense um, in control over accepting or endorsing the changes that are brought about, um, more so than in the case of um, passive interventions. Because what happens in the case of passive interventions is that changes occur abruptly and instantaneously, um, and also these changes may be very dramatic. And they leave no room for a gradual reflection on these changes, and they leave no room for a gradual uh, incorporation of these changes into one's narrative and into one's life story. So that's a very big difference that is relative to the, the um, possibility for an individual to um, autonomously uh, endorse or reject um, the changes that are brought about and also um, to, for example, accept certain changes but re reject other changes. Um, so an individual has much, a lot more control over um, what happens, whereas in a direct intervention the change is a total change, an immediate, immediate change that cannot be um, gradually endorsed or gradually rejected. So that's a very big difference. Um, the second difference that we think is very important is the fact that um, direct um, passive interventions have the ability um, to change an individual very, very dramatically and in a way that may disrupt one's narrative identity um, and also may leave the individual uh, feeling um, kind of um, alienated from his or herself. So dramatic changes can occur with, for example, deep brain stimulation, such as an individual can change instantane instantaneously from being a very um, depressed person to being actually a happy person. Within minutes, this can happen. Also, individuals can develop uh, clinical disinhibition, which is uh, a very serious potential side effect, which may be um, have dramatic consequences. So it's it's these changes to uh, one's identity may be of a, of a, can be of a much bigger um, nature and have a much bigger effect on a person's um, narrative, on a person's uh, life story than in the case of passive interventions such as therapy. 
So um, this is not necessarily problematic, of course, that changes can be dramatic, but it is very important that an individual is able to incorporate these changes into his or her life story in a coherent way. Um, so in a way that it doesn't actually disrupt their life narrative and doesn't uh, leave them feeling alienated. Um, so And for that reason, it's very important that an individual actually gives informed consent for a procedure that is passive, also for a procedure that's active. But especially with passive procedures, it's very important that the individual is warned about the possibility of these dramatic changes and is warned about the possibility of, of these dramatic side effects and changes uh, of one's life story. Um, so when an individual is warned about this and can um, uh, consent to these changes, uh, is fully informed about the possibility of these changes, an individual is, can also be in charge of an, um, a passive intervention. Um, but it's, again, extremely important that the individual uh, is informed about this so the individual can actually also recognize um, what is happening to, to him or her and can actually, at that point, decide whether or not to continue with um, the intervention. The same problem of dramatic changes is not, um, does not occur with, with, of course, active interventions because typically with active interventions, because of the effort that the individual has to put in place, um, these changes occur more gradually and occur more in a, in a natural um, uh, sense for the individual himself or herself. Uh, now the third uh, big uh, topic that we want to uh, that we did discuss and that we think is uh, potentially ethically problematic is the fact that there can also be concealed identity changes um, with the brain stimulation, for example, and that these have been observed in um, many cases. For example, in the brain stimulation for Parkinson's, a lot of individuals develop minor changes such as um, minor disinhibition or. Um, um, minor personality changes becoming more, um, for example, neurotic or becoming um, more, um, um, well, becoming more, um, can't think outgoing, of, uh, outgoing, for example, yes, thank you, Marge, I can mm -hmm. think of the word, becoming more outgoing and changing in a way that for the individual himself or herself is not readable, readily noticeable, but is very noticeable to the partner and the loved ones. And so the partner and the loved ones may actually find these small changes very disturbing and also the fact that the individual himself, for example, doesn't notice these changes and doesn't acknowledge, the, acknowledge these changes and doesn't acknowledge that he or, or she is changed uh, in, a, in a profound way. So the possibility of this is very important because studies have shown, for example, that with individuals, couples where one individual receives the brain stimulation is that up to 50% of couples actually experience marital problems problems due to these um, small concealed changes that one partner doesn't acknowledge but the other partner does readily feel that there is something changed about their, their spouse or their loved one. Um, so again, although this, this can be prob very problematic, such concealed changes, we can limit um, the, the, the um, risks of such changes, uh, of, of the risks of the, such changes exerting uh, big effects if an individual is um, to roughly warn about these changes and informed about these changes before the intervention takes place. So the three, action, the, the, the three main um, domains where we see potential problems can of course be um, overridden, can of course be um, um, made much less problematic if informed consent is guaranteed, guaranteed and if pre and post uh, intervention counseling um, is uh, always present and is always available to the individual. Um, and if those uh, guarantees, those safeguards are actually put in place, um, both um, active and passive interventions can be ethically acceptable. But again, we want to stress that in case of passive interventions, it is much, uh, it is very important that individuals are um, sufficiently warmed, and it's very important that these uh, changes or these interventions are brought about on a voluntary basis, so individuals can decide for themselves whether or not the changes that are brought about to their narrative identity is something that they can incorporate and wish to accept. Um, both in a prospective manner and in a, a retrospective manner, um, so individuals can be fully autonomous and uh, in undergoing such interventions.
so these are the main conclusions and thank you very much for your attention.